work is more. It's both a gift and an opportunity to make a difference. This perspective of work is integral and substantial in building anything great. So what are leaders doing about it? How are they building great teams, products, and companies? What are they doing to solve today's biggest challenges in human capital and motivation? Welcome to Solved, a podcast that brings insights into the fascinating world of hiring, retention, and management of the most skilled people. Today, I have with me a special guest, Rachel Horwitz, a global leader for training and development at Convertec. Rachel, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Andrew. I'm going to ask you a few questions, and um, we hope the insights you share will be helpful to the community of Solvable. So let's start with the first one. Work is more. It's both a gift and an opportunity. What are your thoughts about this? No, it's really a good question. And I was thinking about this because a lot of people, when we think about work, it, it gives us structure in our day. It gives us purpose. It gives us an opportunity to meet and work with people that aren't in our vicinity, no matter what kind of work we do or how we define work. You know, I think it really puts this opportunity for people in society to feel like they value and feel like they have, um, that they're bigger than just what they've been put on this earth for. And I think, you know, when we think about the future of work and when we think about uh, companies can do, we need to tap into that fact that people aren't just showing up for work for a paycheck. They're there because they are working for a company that's meaningful to them, that focuses on the things that they find important, um, that has people that they work with that are that they enjoy working with, that they have fun with, that they learn from, that they get challenged from. Um, and so there's different that there's many aspects of what companies can do to consider, you know, how important the the idea of work is is for people. And um, you know, in this day and age where we're all working remotely, there's a lot of technology that is available now to help bring people together. But we can't forget that that me sitting in my office every day doing work, doing work for a company called Convitech, it has to be meaningful or else um, we're going to lose the war on talent and we're not going to be able to keep and retain people. Great. That's brilliant. Um, what bring, what gives you meaning at, at work at Convitech? What gives you meaning in what you do? Um, I would say a few things. First off, I have now, I've been at Comitech for three years and it's a, a global medical device company. We um, work in the area of wound care, ostomy, catheters, and infusion care. So the amount of patients that we have the opportunity to touch with different levels of health is really important. And so what brings me meaning is the fact that we actually focus on our customer, whether it's in our um, our values, our workplace mottos and vision and mission. It's really about our customers. And um, for me, having always been in companies that make something, whether it's cosmetics, as I used to work in the beauty industry or work in the pet care food industry, um, the idea that I can touch customers in a different way is something that's meaningful for me. So that's what Convitech as a whole, um, as, as an organization, its purpose is meaningful to me. As an individual employee and as a leader, um, I joined Convitec because I wanted to make something new. Um, mm. It was an opportunity to build a global learning and development function where there was nothing or very little before. Um, so to really get in there and understand what our employees need, what is the business need, how can I really make an impact? And I've been working to do that for the past three years that I've been there so far. That's what's really meaningful to me is that. Every day, I'm not solving a problem that's already been solved. I'm solving a problem that hasn't been solved yet. And it, it really keeps me on my toes, keeps me um, motivated and engaged in a lot of different ways. Wow. Can you um, uh, talk to us through your journey for the last three years? You said it was something that you started. It was not something that existed. So how challenging was it, but also how rewarding was it? Very good question. Um, definitely challenging, definitely rewarding. And I like and I'm still on the journey. Let's be clear. <laughs> okay. Um, so coming into Job's Convitec, not done yet. <laughs> not done yet. Coming into Convitec, the idea of training at the company was to do your compliance training every year. And it's a very regulated industry, of course, being a medical device. So that is understandable. But the concept of development was very far away. And I happened to come in at the time where we had just had um, one of our first engagement surveys. And in the area of um, 
or what am I calling it? In the little area of development, there was nothing. It was negative percentage points. We basically everybody in the employees had rated it zero. Um, so I came in with clearly quite a challenge. And then what I did was I really wanted to define what is a learning culture. What does that mean at Combatech? So in my first few months, it went, it meant um, meeting with all of the senior leaders to understand what was in existence, what they're looking for, how to help the business, really getting in and involved with the employees themselves to understand why, you know, why did they join Combatech? What are they looking to grow? What are their capabilities that they're needed, that are, that are needed? And how are we going to actually do this? So First, I wanted to define that learning culture, which was to understand, again, what is the business, what do senior leaders need, um, to clean up any um, of the learning operations side. So on the, the less pretty and sexy side of things, to clean up the data, the curriculum, the learning management system, to put some standards and process and guidelines um, in there so that we could then build curriculum that met the needs of the employees and also then be able to measure it. So um, so really just defining what did we want the North Star to look like? What was that culture? What would that culture look like? And then taking the steps to, to build upon that. Um, and I would have to say, well, I do have to say that after our first year, my first year, we had another engagement survey and the learning and development um, area went up 17 percentage points. So um, in my wow. first year, I was very proud. Um, and since then, we've just had a lot to build off of, which has been really fortunate. Wow. Can I ask you if you ever had an imposter syndrome? Oh, my, every day. <laughs> 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 I do think about that <laughs> a lot, actually. Um, yeah, because, you know, I, um, I don't have a degree in learning and development. I've never lived outside of um, the United States, but here I am in a global role leading learning and development. Who am I <laughs> to do that? And I've had a lot of great mentors and um, I've worked with so many actually really talented people. I have imposter syndrome every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so that important you that you shared. That? <laughs> 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 Yeah, I can cut this out if you don't want me to put it out there. But it was so, um, you know, thanks for sharing that. You know, many people need to hear this um, and, you know, find encouragement in this. In, in spite of all this, you thrive. You've done so well. And it's okay to have those thoughts. Uh, yeah. So thanks for sharing that. And being it's candid. about, like, not trying to solve everything at one right. at the same time. Right. It's identifying those low hanging fruit because what I um, interesting that you say that, because what I came in, I was like, oh, I'm learning and development. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And really, I realized that just a little bit, just by putting out a, um, a micro learning that talked about building um, communication skills that made the employees happy. And that made the leaders like, wow, we actually have something. So really just the little, those low hanging fruit helps to build your confidence. And then you just build on that and build on that and build on that. That's true. I'm going to, um, I, ha I have a follow-up question. I saw your LinkedIn post about micro learnings and how five minutes of learning a day can, can make a big difference over time. Very insightful because that's what's happening around us. You you have platforms, social media platforms that engage people and the ability for you to produce content that not just is insightful but also entertaining makes all the difference. Uh, TikTok, for example. Um, but as a learning and development leader, do you believe that the learnings that you take five minutes a day, well, is that going to be a part? Is that going to get into your spirit at some point? Because some of the learnings concepts require much deeper thought, understanding, and and brainstorming. Yeah. Um, so the quick bites that you take, as a, what, what's your thought about it? Is it going to is there is it going to stay with you? Such a good question, and I, oh, I would have to say over the past six months, I've shifted a lot because I did used to think. This micro learning thing, it's just a way to deal with people who don't have large attention spans. That's all it's good for. Mm. Um, but I think we just need to be clear on my, what micro learning is good for and what it might not be good for. You're absolutely right. If you want to learn Power BI, a micro learning most likely is not going to do it. 
However, if you're taking a Power BI class and you're learning all of these different concepts that your brain at the end of the, whether it's a eight hour class in person or a one hour class online, your brain is overloaded with information. Where a micro learning comes into play or specifically these three to five questions, it's that learning reinforcement. It helps to mitigate the forgetting curve because mm -hmm. it's constant. The way that we've done it here at my company, Convitec, we're using a platform that um, feeds you three to five questions based on something you may have already learned before to help really reinforce that learning and those concepts. So it con consistently challenges your brain to remember what you learned, how to apply it, and, um, and to keep it in the forefront of your mind. So I think that that's one way that micro learning will have a place. That's in learning reinforcement. I also think kind of on the front end that micro learning has a place in building that desire to pull more learning. Mm. Over the past years, we always talk about pull, pull. Learners need to pull their own learning and they need to have that desire for it. But now with so much content, our learners are overwhelmed. So a micro learning, I think, has a good concept to push a little bit of learning and peak somebody's interest and their desire to learn more and pull more. So again, I think that micro learning has its place if it's positioned correctly within the entire learning journey. Brilliant. So it's kind of an appetizer, uh, not the entree. Yeah, it's an appetizer. Exactly. Brilliant. As an appetizer or an aperitif. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, you're a learning and development leader. Um, how do you believe that uh, learning and development, uh, what's their correlation to building a better culture, a culture that um, thrives over time? And how important is learning and development to building great cultures? Really, really, really good question. I think that in the world today, it is so fast moving. Companies are, there's start. There's startup companies. I'm going to say this and you can edit it however it needs. But okay. um, there are startup companies every day. There's companies that are completely reinventing themselves. Um, you know, companies such as Visa or Ford, who are now tech companies <laughs> who've been around for years and years and years. So our companies, our government, everyone is moving at such a fast, 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 fast pace that learning and development and people that want to learn, that need to learn, that need to upskill themselves or um, or practice something new or learn something from others, that is absolutely the only way for these companies to continue to survive. What ha what we like to say is, you know, what got you somewhere isn't going to get you there tomorrow. Right. Um, and so I think it's really important for companies to build a culture Learning kind of scares people because people are like, oh, I don't want to go to school. But the culture of curiosity, of picking your head up and looking out at what else others are doing within your organization or what your competitors are doing, all of that is learning every day. Um, and so I think it's how it's positioned, of course, but we need to build a culture of people who are willing to change and willing to adjust and flex and be more agile. Great. So just curious, so learning and development doesn't just have to be, you know, for getting people into process orientation, um, you know, business knowledge, learning and development. Do you see that department making a transition into educating your workforce, into giving them competitive intelligence, giving product marketing or um, product management the research uh, and learning they need? Would it? Do you see that evolve into training new feed on sales? So, how do do you see the department evolve from where it is now? Uh, and pivot into something more subjective in the, in the coming days? Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of companies are already there. To bring it to reality, actually, what we talk about is at Combatech, actually, is who owns product marketing, or, or sorry, product training, as an example. Is it a marketer's role? Okay. Is it Salesforce effectiveness? Is it learning and development? Is it change management? And I think that it's, or communications. Um, I think that it's, learning and development has to be in there. In fact, we just, created a new learn a, a new product development process at our company and I made sure that the idea of training is smack dab in the middle of that process. 
because too often we get to launch a new product and they forgot to train the the salespeople. The salespeople don't know who their competitors are of these new products. They don't know really, you know, any of the features or benefits of it. And all of a sudden it's market. They go to market and they're standing there with a deer, you know, like a deer in headlights, not knowing enough. So I truly believe that not only does training have a role in that, but it needs to be really tightly integrated into that process so that as um, R&D is working with supply chain, is working with product marketing, that the idea of training is in, in, to, <laughs> integrated in it um, right in the middle of it. Otherwise, it becomes an afterthought. And I think that happens a little too often. Um, I've seen it not only in this company, but in previous companies. So does that answer your question? God. Yes, absolutely. So it is it is integral and there's no two ways about it. Great. We, we touched a little upon this in the previous question, but how do you build – learning is important. It's integral. It's uh, it's critical to every organization. But how do, you, how do you build the great learning experiences for employees? When I saw that question, I, I thought about it. So I want to actually go to what I wrote, <laughs> if that's okay. okay. Absolutely. Because one thing that I've learned – very much here at Comatech is the importance of knowing your audience. So mm. to build a really good learning experience, you have to know who your audience is, where are they? Again, anything from are they going to be getting their learning on a computer to what language do they speak? What um, what uh, time zone are they in? To, you know, how do they feel about what they're being asked to learn? How do they feel that fits in with their day-to-day -day work? So it really, really starts with the audience mm -hmm. to understand a good learning experience. Um, and I feel like oftentimes we think about the content and we think that they need to learn this new product, but they really, you really need to teach this person this new product. So that's why I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we tend to forget is um, in building great learning experiences is, you know, right now there's so many tools. There's augmented reality, there's virtual reality, there's learning reinforcement. There's so many fun gadgets that we can build in, but you need to think about like, does can the company support that? Do your facilitators feel confident facilitating? Oftentimes you get subject matter experts who very much know their knowledge and their content, but not the ability to teach it in an augmented reality format. Um, so again, I know that none of this is very glamorous, but if you don't have at least those two things, then um, any great learning experience, you know, with all the fun bells and whistles isn't really going to work. Um, and then, and that's a side of the fact that the good business KPIs and the learning objectives, they all just need to be crystal clear um, in order to build a good learning uh, journey. Got it. So it all starts with understanding your audience. Without that, any learning experience that you try to create is going to be a colossal failure. Well, I know. I mean, it doesn't sound very glamorous, but it's true. <laughs> it's, like, it. it's like making, you know, your new set of clothes and nobody comes into the store to buy it because they didn't want bell-bottom jeans. They wanted that's right. <laughs> they didn't want collared shirts. That's right. <laughs> they wanted shirts with buttons. So, you know, you just need to really know your audience, just like marketing would. That's right. And this can be more true. It's coming from uh, the mouth of a global learning and development leader. So <laughs> it, 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 can, it can be more true. So thanks for sharing that. One last question. What do you think leaders are up against in, in reality um, when it comes to hiring, retention, uh, mobilization, motivation? What are they? what are they up against today and what's the reality of it? And what's your take on that? That is a question with a lot of different avenues. <laughs> a lot of questions <laughs> that that one could take. I think when it comes to talent and when it comes to human capital, I think leaders are up against what they don't know. Um, you know, leaders spend a lot of times in setting our goals, setting our budgets, making sure we meet our performance reviews. They're, you know, making sure that they um, meet their timelines and their projects and everything that they set aside that I feel like they forget that doing all that work are people. That's right. <laughs> people who, uh, you know, who 
may not want to have an hour and a half commute. People who, you know, maybe having a bad day, um, you know, people who may not believe in the project that they're working on, but this is their job. So what I say, what I say might not be the most positive aspect of it, but I think we need to recognize that if you're losing people, um, if you have a high attrition rate, if it's hard to find talent, then you might need to look at the practices of leadership and tying into the, the human aspect of it. You know, we all want to work for a company that's very successful and has big bonuses. And, you know, we're really but we also want to work for a company that means something to us in um, and makes us feel like we're important. That's right. So the challenges with talent are more to do with with leadership. It begins at leadership. Leadership is, has to play a big part. Is that what is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. The person that you report into your direct manager um, and even probably the person in ahead of them. Like, here's an example, actually, in my company right now, it's Q4. We literally have, I in HR have 10 initiatives that I need to complete by the end of the year. I know that product development also has at least two or three products that they want to get out the door. Sales has their forecasts and goals that they need to make. Finance is working on wrapping up this year's budget and last year's budget. None of what I just said, actually, um, and, and those are all very important things for the company to be successful. But did I just say anything about the people it takes to make all those things happen? Right. They're the ones that are now working 14 hours a day and, uh, you know, and feeling exhausted and pulled in a million different directions and being asked to train and do your compliance training, but also budget and forecast and meet all your deadlines. And all of that is happening right now in Q4 for everybody. You know, and I think that that tends to make people now, again, pick their heads up, look around at what others are doing, look around at, you know, what else may be out there and is a big risk at helping companies to really keep the talent that they want to keep in the long term. That's right. I fully agree with you. I did say it was the last question, but I'm going to ask you <laughs> one more. Okay, yeah. uh, you have a lot of insights to share, believe me. What's the one quality, according to you, from all these years of learning, um, what's the one quality a leader should possess today when it comes to managing people or motivating people, according to you? <laughs> one quality. I would say, I say this term curiosity, and I know I used it earlier, but it always tends to come up. I think, and, and as it relates to people, I think that leaders need to be curious about their people. Um, again, we don't just show up to work one dimensional. So take the time to really get to know who are your employees that are working for you. What are they? What drives them? What motivates them? What gets them out of bed? What are some of the challenges that they're facing mm. every day that they can't come to their best about? So, so one aspect I say curiosity, and that's about the people. The reason I also say curiosity is because you're direct reports are going to watch you as a leader and they're going to emulate you as a leader. So if you're curious right. again about your competitors, if you're curious about what's happening in what's happening outside of um, the immediate work that you're doing, if you're even curious about what's happening in different areas within the business you're working on, that's what your employees see that builds their curiosity and um, ultimately their desire to learn and grow and really helps you work a lot better as a leader. I love when my um, team comes to me and says, hey, Rachel, did you see that this person in this part of the company is doing this? What can that mean for us? I love that. I love that. Or, hey, um, you know, I just found out that externally there's going to be this new regulation that's going to impact us. Um, that's what makes me really happy and motivated as a leader. So I think it's that idea of curiosity. Got it. Very well said. Thanks for that, Rachel. Really appreciate it. Thank you. That concludes our uh, today's podcast on salt and uh, rachel thank you again for coming as a guest and um, sharing your thoughts <music>